This video is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. For any aspiring content creators or business owners, Squarespace is the perfect platform to get you up and running with your own website. No coding skills needed, instead select from dozens of pre-built templates which you can customize as much or as little as you want using simple, easy to use drag and drop tools. I'm currently using Squarespace to design and build a website for Galaxy Class Pictures, my new production company. Previously, I was able to integrate a Printful merch store directly to my Squarespace site, but another additional revenue stream for businesses are tips and members areas. Thankfully, Squarespace has all the tools needed for Galaxy Class Pictures to create premium content and build a community with its member areas features. Follow the link in the description to start making your own website with your own domain name and use the promo code Rowan J. Coleman for 10% off your first purchase. Thank you once again to Squarespace for helping me keep the lights on over here. And now, on with the video. In 2009, South African-born filmmaker Neil Blomkamp exploded onto the scene with his feature debut, District 9. However, his second film, Elysium, while being a decently entertaining sci-fi action flick, was largely seen as a disappointment by many. Even Blomkamp himself later disparaged his script for Elysium. Therefore, the pressure was mounting for his third film, one which would take him back to his roots. Before District 9, Neil Blomkamp had been turning heads in the film industry with a steady stream of impressive short films. One of these shorts, Alive in Joburg, became the foundation for District 9, and following Elysium, Blomkamp took further inspiration from his early efforts. Tetraval was one such early effort. In fact, in many ways it was the short which established his signature style. The short was presented as a fictional corporate advertisement designed to sell a robotic police force. Years later, Blomkamp was listening to some Die Antwoord music while looking over the designs for the droids in Elysium, and suddenly came up with a way of expanding the original Tetraval short into a feature. What if one of these police robots was found and essentially raised by Die Antwoord? As Elysium's production was drawing to a close, Sony and Media Rights Capital were keen to work with Blomkamp again, and so he pitched them the idea which would become Chappie. Having worked extremely well with the director on Elysium, producer Simon Kinberg agreed to help bring Chappie to life. Blomkamp quickly got to work on the script, once again enlisting the help of his wife Terry Tatchell as co-writer. He also re-enlisted the help of his regular collaborators at Weta Workshop and Image Engine to develop the look of the film. The primary task among the concept artists was of course designing Chappie himself. The original robot design seen in Tetraval was heavily inspired by the character Briarios from the Japanese anime franchise Appleseed. The difficulty of the design was in creating a highly expressive character, but also a droid which looked practical. Ultimately, the final design closely resembled the robot seen in the original short film. Top of the list when it came to casting was, of course, Charlotte Copley. Copley chose to give Chappie many childlike tendencies, essentially starting out as a toddler, progressing into a teenager, and eventually a full adult. The next cast members near to the top of the list were naturally D. Antwoord themselves, Watkin Jones aka Ninja, and Henri Dutois aka Yolande Visseur. Blomkamp was a huge fan of the duo's music, and they were huge fans of his movies. Blomkamp even offered the lead role in Elysium to Jones before approaching Matt Damon. While Jones had turned down the offer for Elysium, the prospect of essentially playing themselves in Chappie was much more attractive and would no doubt boost their fame internationally if the film was a hit, thus they accepted. Filling out the other street gang roles in the film would be Jose Pablo Cantillo as America and Brandon Orit as Hippo. Both actors had previously worked with Blomkamp. Cantillo played Sandro in Elysium where he met an explosive end at the hands of Charlotte Copley's Kruger. Orit appeared as one of Cobus's mercenaries in District 9, who also met a grisly end at the hands of Charlotte Copley. Two other former District 9 stars were Jason Cope as a Tetraval mechanic and Eugene Kumbinyawa as Gangster King. Populating the characters at Tetraval Corporation would be Dev Patel as Dion, Hugh Jackman as Vincent, and Sigourney Weaver as CEO Michelle Bradley. 
Dev Patel was Blomkamp's first choice for Dion, the actor having made waves ever since his lead role in Slumdog Millionaire. Initially, Patel believed he was too young to play the character, but Blomkamp saw Dion as akin to the young Silicon Valley tech startups like Mark Zuckerberg, albeit with more developed social skills. In contrast to many of Hugh Jackman's most popular roles, Blomkamp wanted the actor to lean hard into his Australian background. The two collaborated on the character, seeing Vincent as a kind of American high school jock by way of Crocodile Dundee. Jackman was enthusiastic at the amount of Australian slang in Vincent's dialogue and loved the idea of giving the character a mullet. Sigourney Weaver was, and still is, an icon of the sci-fi genre ever since her turn as Ellen Ripley in the Alien movies, of which Blomkamp is a huge fan. Although Weaver would only work on the movie for a short time, she and Blomkamp worked very well together and Weaver enjoyed the opportunity to play a villain. Filming began in October 2013, once again in Johannesburg, South Africa. To give the film a sense of authenticity, many of the locations used were those which had seen real street gang violence, or were still inhabited by street gangs. The Ponty building was originally built for high-end housing, but was eventually taken over by various gangs who, over the years, discarded their rubbish right into the hollow centre of the building, creating a small landfill. In order to safely film in the building, the production had most of the inner windows welded shut, so no onlookers could throw anything at the cast or crew. The production also made use of Neil Blomkamp's childhood home, which had since been taken over by squatters. The house was then dressed to be used as Hippo's main hideout. For Ninja and Yolandi's hideout, the production made use of a famous abandoned power station in Soweto. To dress the space, D'Ant would brought in their own team of artists who had worked on their music videos to create their hideout. While the duo's addition to the film certainly made for nice visuals, their on-set behaviour was a different story. While details are hard to come by, the truth no doubt being mixed in with tabloid rumours, many cast and crew have since said that Dee Antwoord, particularly Watkin Jones, made the set a living hell. Brandon Orrit had an especially dim view of Jones, who apparently kept trying to give Orrit acting advice. Allegedly, the relationship between Jones and Blomkamp became so bad, they could only communicate through an intermediary. Thankfully, Dee Antwoord's behaviour didn't drag down the schedule, as Chappie wrapped after 60 days of filming. The visual effects were once again handled by Image Engine, whose primary task was animating and compositing in Chappie. They used the same match-moving and painting out techniques for Chappie, which they had used for the aliens in District 9 and the droids in Elysium. To help with the compositing, character interactions and movements, Chartel Copley wore a partial costume over his grey suit. The much larger Moose robot was primarily designed by Neil Blomkamp himself. Just as practical versions of the Scout robot were built for use on set, a huge 12-foot tall model of the Moose was also created for filming. Once in action, however, the Moose was completely digital, with scale cardboard cutouts used on location for eyelines, and practical explosions and other pyrotechnics were also used. The music score was composed by seasoned pro Hans Zimmer, with additional music from Steve Mazard and Andrew Kozinski. To complement the themes surrounding the robots and artificial intelligence, Zimmer opted for a mostly electronic score, creating simple but versatile motifs for Chappie and Vincent. After a breakneck speed production, Chappie was released on the 6th of March 2015. As the last instalment in this spiritual trilogy of films, Chappie is comfortably the weakest one. Though when it comes to film criticisms, I'm never one for hyperbole, and I don't think Chappie should be too harshly derided for its flaws, as pronounced as they may be. Just like with Elysium, you can tell while watching how much passion went into this film. Blomkamp's signature style hasn't evolved much since District 9, but his gritty lo-fi production with seamless CGI never gets old for me. His influences are clear as day, but the spin he puts on those familiar tropes is still fresh and exciting. From a purely technical standpoint, Chappie is just as impressive as District 9 and Elysium. The visual effects used to create Chappie are utterly flawless. I recently rewatched the movie on 4K Blu-ray in preparation for this video, and I was simply flabbergasted at how real Chappie looked. The action is also very solid, in fact this may be where Blomkamp has just gotten better and better with each film. While his preference for handheld camera remains, 
Blomkamp's grasp of scene geography and eye for striking compositions makes each shootout and close quarters fight feel even more epic, while being just as visceral as his previous work. Hans Zimmer's score is also a decently enjoyable propellant for the action and drama. There's the usual emphasis on percussion and brass bursts, but the heavy synth makes for some real head-banging tracks. The motif used for Chappie is certainly nice. It's appropriately wondrous and childlike when played in sparse light notes, but it's also sweeping and triumphant when some real power is put behind it. The inclusion of distorted male choir for Vincent's motif is the perfect way to convey his simmering rage and anti-AI stance. Overall, it's a very solid score. However, when we talk about Chappie, we have to address the elephant in the room, that elephant being D. Antwoord. To be fair, I can see why Blomkamp wanted them in the movie so much. After all, they were instrumental in him coming up with the idea for Chappie in the first place. In terms of pure aesthetics, they also totally fit the genre. Ninja and Yolandi really do look like they've been ripped straight from the pages of a 2000 AD comic book. And seeing as how District 9 did such a good job of showcasing South Africa to an international audience, it's easy to see why Blomkamp would want to do the same for one of his favourite bands. It's also worth remembering that Charlto Copley had virtually no acting experience before playing Vickers Vandermeerve, and to D. Antwoord's credit, they certainly bring a lot of energy to their scenes in Chappie. That being said, while Copley had little acting experience before District 9, it's clear he understood the acting process and was able to draw on this knowledge to craft his performance. Therefore, while he's larger than life in District 9, Elysium and Chappie, it still feels like a real personality from a real person each time. Ninja and Yolandi, however, are just very shallow, very thin characters. They're really just playing themselves, and considering how they design their own hideout and flaunt their own merch throughout the movie, their scenes feel more like extended music videos rather than natural parts of the story. Their presence also distracts from the far more interesting material surrounding Dev Patel's Dion and Hugh Jackman's Vincent. Having Dion apart from Chappie for so much of the film feels like a real mistake. D. Antwoord could easily have worked as supporting players, because although Hippo is an intimidating villain and Ninja's desperation to pay off his debt to him works fine, it's nowhere near as interest as the ideological conflict between Dion and Vincent. As I said before, details surrounding the onset conflicts perpetuated by D. Antwoord are hard to come by, but it wouldn't surprise me to learn that their behaviour was the main reason they're basically nowhere to be seen in the marketing. Patel and Jackman are always pushed more, and rightly so. Just like Charlotte Copley, Patel and Jackman's performances are over the top but totally believable and terrific to watch. Dion chastising gangsters as barbarians and philistines is hilarious. You're a filthy person, you're a terrible shitty person! He's really smarter than you let ever be, you philistine! Chappie, don't let this barbarian ruin your creativity! Nurture your creativity, Chappie! And Vincent is like the most Australian man to ever Australian. The fact that he can sport this hairdo and say lines like, You're making me as cross as a frog in a song, mate. And still be totally scary is amazing. But if there's one saving grace with the movie, it's Chappie himself. The design is utterly fantastic. Believable is a practical law enforcement tool, but also wonderfully expressive and endearing. Charlotte Copley's childlike energy, which drives the excellent animation, makes Chappie such a fun and adorable character. Chappie's lack of world knowledge also leads to hilarious dark comedy, like when he's carjacking people and screaming, Don't steal other people's things! throwing shurikens into police officers while saying, <laughs> and breaking every bone in Vincent's body while declaring, No hurtings! No violence! If the movie had leaned all the way into the fun of an out-of-control gangster robot, I think Chappie would have been perfectly fine as a sci-fi action comedy. But in also trying to tackle themes of artificial intelligence and consciousness, it stumbles. These topics are never really explored in any real depth. Dion just kind of codes artificial life into being, and Chappie discovers how to digitize consciousness by overclocking some PlayStations. And that's not even getting into the existential terror of Dion's mind being ported into a robot body, which he doesn't even blink an eye at. It feels as if Chappie was really trying to be two movies at once. On the one hand is a story about artificial intelligence, consciousness, and what makes us human, expressed as a philosophical conflict between two corporate employees. On the other hand is a fun action comedy about a quirky robot committing crimes. 
but placed together, these two halves end up distracting from one another. The rich narrative themes aren't explored because the living machine which Dion and Vincent's conflict hinges on barely spends any time with Dion or Vincent. On the other hand, the fun action comedy is interrupted when the movie tries to use these characters for big sweeping drama. In the end, Chappie's failings come not from a lack of talent or ambition. I think the core issue with the film is that they had too many ideas. By trying to do them all, there simply isn't enough time to really explore any of them to their fullest. It's a shame because there are flashes of brilliance all over the place. It's worth watching just for the chappy character alone, and there's plenty of great visual effects and action to at least keep things entertaining. The film could certainly have been more than it is, but hey, as the R-rated version of Short Circuit, you could do far worse. While District 9 was an unabashed hit, and Elysium was a decent success, Chappie was unfortunately met with mostly negative reviews and a disappointing box office. Most of the criticisms naturally surrounded Dee Antwoord's presence in the movie, something which has only become more uncomfortable as the duo continue to act like horrible people. At the box office, Chappie grossed $102 million worldwide against a budget of $49 million. It's possible the movie broke even, but only just. The largely poor reception to the film cancelled any prospect of a sequel, and Blomkamp has since said that his standing in the wider industry definitely took a hit. That being said, if you're someone who believes Blomkamp hasn't been busy since, you'd be sorely mistaken. Off the back of Chappie, Blomkamp briefly developed a sequel to Aliens, showing off concept art via his Instagram, with Sigourney Weaver and Michael Bean both stating their interest in reprising their respective roles. Unfortunately, because Fox was also producing Ridley Scott's line of Alien prequel films, they chose not to develop the movie further. Blomkamp was then later attached to direct a sequel to the original Robocop titled Robocop Returns. However, the director later departed the project, citing creative differences. During his break from feature films, Blomkamp founded his own production company, Oat Studios, which produced a number of live action and animated shorts, released via Steam and YouTube. This is honestly some of Blomkamp's best stuff, in a way bringing him back to his roots making high concept shorts with shockingly good visual effects. If you haven't seen any of these, you absolutely have to check them out. Unfortunately, attempts at capitalizing on the attention generated by these shorts to create a feature film were largely unsuccessful. A crowdfunding campaign to make a feature version of the short Firebase was unsuccessful, and the horror film Demonic was a critically panned flop. Thankfully, it seems Blomkamp had enough goodwill at Sony to land the job of directing Gran Turismo, due to release later this year. Now, some may be asking why I care so much about Neil Blomkamp's career. To some, he's simply a one-trick pony, hitting it big with District 9, and then failing to live up to that high standard ever since but I personally feel like this is an unfair assessment of the man's career. While I agree District 9 is comfortably Neil Blomkamp's best film, the rest of his work also showcases clear talent and a unique style. I've made my goal of becoming a filmmaker myself no secret on this channel, and Neil Blomkamp is someone I find incredibly inspiring. It's worth remembering that Blomkamp got his start simply by making cool stuff on the internet, and mostly before platforms like YouTube even existed. He's been a working feature film director for 14 years, and the vast majority of his work is totally original. Only Gran Turismo is based on any pre-existing material. Mid-budget, R-rated original sci-fi was some of the most fertile ground for exciting, fresh storytelling and filmmaking back in the 80s and 90s. And it feels like Neil Blomkamp was the only person still trying to continue that tradition in the 2010s. When it was clear Hollywood was no longer interested in doing that, you have to commend the guy for taking a big swing with Oat Studios. A company with such an experimental business model, Blomkamp admitted it was basically a dumpster fire of cash. Now, I don't really care about Gran Turismo, I never played their games, but I hope it's successful enough for Blomkamp to make another District 9, another Elysium, or even another Chappie. Because these movies are the exact opposite of so many of the worst trends in the entertainment industry right now. They're original works based on new ideas rather than rehashes of decades-old IPs. They don't rely on outright abusing visual effects artists, and they look all the better for it. And these are movies which are actually about something, or at the very least, trying to be. 
These are movies which strive not to return to a bygone era, but to take the lessons of what came before and to aspire to a new era which is bold, fresh and exciting. Think what you will of the movies themselves, but I think we can all agree that what they represent is something truly awesome. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and share, and make sure to hit the bell icon to stay up to date with all of my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my Patreon or YouTube members using the links down below. There you can see videos early as well as some exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.